kind of data experiment we did, looking at a lot of our data in relation to uh, our gambling customers right around the time of the World Cup, basically to see what we could see. Um, I run product management at Quova. Tobias, um, I'll let you introduce yourself. All right. So I'm Tobias Speckbacher. I'm the uh, VP of Emerging Technologies at Quova, which really means that I get to work with um, lots of uh, different companies these days that are pre-product or post-product to uh, see how they uh, fit into our infrastructure to make things work there. Uh, I've been with Cova for 10 years. Uh, I've had multiple roles there, so I kind of went through all technical positions pretty much that we have there from research to operations. Um, and recently uh, moved into this role. And uh, that's pretty much it. So a little bit about Quova. Quova provides information about IP addresses, and we provide geographic and network information. And what our customers do with that information is, is basically provide richer, more engaging, more relevant experiences for their users. So whether it's um, geotargeting and other kind of targeting for search and other kind of advertising, or financial services and e-commerce companies helping to mitigate the risk of fraud, um, you have video on demand and sports companies who stream live video content and other rich content. Um, one of the reasons they're able to do that with copyrighted content is because um, solutions like ours allow them to comply with the regulations and the other contracts they have that restrict them from streaming content in, in other places. Major League Baseball is an example in the US where legislation actually prevents them from streaming live games in markets where they've sold the rights to broadcasters. So the reason they can stream live games is because they can tell where you are if you're in a home market and restrict that content. And that's how ga um, gaming customers use this as well. Uh, gambling obviously has, diff online gambling has different restrictions in different places around the world. The reason you can gamble online where it is legal is because online gambling companies can tell whether you're not, whether you're in somewhere where it's legal or not. Um, yeah, so as I said, we took we have a, a number of gambling customers, mostly in the UK, but um, all over the world. And we took some of their data and looked at it in relation to um, right around the time of the World Cup, as I said. So a little bit about, Tobias will talk a little bit about the methodology in our data. Okay, so the, uh, the way we get the data is we have uh, what we call a closed uh, feedback system that um, we basically, as customers use our data, we get individual transaction data back from them, which we use for accounting purposes, but also to focus our research efforts. So if you have the, 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 IP, the internet, the IPv4 space basically is 4.2 billion addresses. Um, not all of those are assigned, so there's about 2.8 billion addresses that are assigned right now. But again, not all of those are used by actual users. A lot of that is infrastructure space. And the majority of that traffic um, comes from a, from a subset of that. So we use that feedback data as a, a significant sample to target uh, the areas that are important for our customers um, to um, uh, focus our research on. The other thing that we do um, is as we get that data back, we release data, uh, we release our IP data every week. As we get that data back, uh, we uh, join individual IP addresses back onto all the dimensions that we have available on uh, that specific IP address or the, the network at large, and uh, we store that. So we can basically perform dimensional analysis across um, all the feedback data that we receive. And that's about um, 30 billion queries per month. Um, that, again, is a subset of the queries that are actually performed against our data. Um, the actual number is probably you know, way north of 100 billion a month because some customers have higher performance requirements and uh, choose to implement it differently. That doesn't allow them to uh, give feedback data back to us. Um, what else is there? So some of the, some of the information that we, that we assign to an IP address includes geographic information from continent down to postal code. And then the network characteristics we assign are things like the carrier or ISP, the organization that is responsible for the content of the network, the domain, uh, the, the speed of the connection, how the connection is routed through the internet, whether, the, whether the, that IP address is associated with um, anonymizing activity, and things like that. And we have this data going back 
pretty much since we started, about 10 years worth of data. You can imagine there's a lot of data there. Um, because we have so much data, uh, well, one of the reasons we haven't looked at it yet in the way that we, we've started to look at it is because dealing with all this data is kind of onerous. There's a lot of data to deal with. And so we'll talk a little bit about the technologies that we use to actually aggregate some of the data so it's easier to report against and also just, um, just mine it. Um, a little bit about gambling, though. So online gambling has a kind of storied history. I, I mentioned the reason you can gamble online is because these companies can now tell whether you're somewhere where it's legal. Back in 2006, you saw stories uh, especially about European companies and executives of European companies being indicted in the U.S. because they were breaking the U.S. laws by allowing their customers to gamble, um, by allowing U.S. citizens from the U.S. to gamble. So being able to tell where your users are coming from is critical to industries like gambling. Um, and gambling in general, online gambling is a growth market. So it's, um, it represents 8% of the total market, or it did last year, which is, which is significant in terms of the market, and it's also growing. So it's, it's growing 13% um, per year is projected to about $36 billion by 2012, which is, which is a large market. This is all according to H2, which is a, a sort of industry, um, a gambling industry analyst. Uh, and, and because of the legality, it's mainly in Europe and Asia that you see online gambling. That's not to say there isn't any gambling in North America, though, uh, in, in the US. In the US, Gambling is traditionally legislated by states. Different states have different laws. You can actually gamble online. You can do things like you can bet on horse races in certain states. Um, and you can play poker online for money in some cases. But what's happening in the US, there's legislation now being passed to allow certain kinds of gambling uh, across the US. It will still be regulated by states. And one of the reasons that's happening is because there's other laws being passed to allow that gambling to be taxed. And of course, once you you know, it, it is a significant market. Um, once you start taxing it, of course, it, it represents a uh, significant revenue stream for the government. So it, that's one reason why you're going to see that. And what, what you're seeing now is some of those companies, those same companies that were in trouble in 2006, are coming to the US, and they're either setting up shop or buying some of the existing gambling um, organizations in the US. Um, so, and gambling is interesting because it has, because it's, it's worldwide, it has a lot of the aspects that make IP address geolocation interesting. You need to localize the language to the, your customer. You need to uh, know where your customers are coming from so you can market to them. And you need to, um, you need to restrict access. And there's also a lot of fraud involved. Especially during these big events, what you see is um, online gambling houses, especially smaller ones, will be blackmailed by um, fraudsters who will say, you know, I've, I've set up a system that can take down your gambling site, and I'm going to do that, you know, during the World Cup unless you, you know, unless you pay me X amount of money. And so it's really important to them, you know, you, they, some of these sites have been destroyed because they've ignored these threats. Some of them just pay out. But it's really important to them to be able to understand what threats are real and also help prevent them. So it's a, it, it has a nice broad application for IPGO. Um, so a little bit about how we went about this. We worked with um, a design company called Stamen Design, and they do a lot with really interesting visualizations, and they do a lot with geography. They did the maps for um, the, the last Olympics. I think they're, they're doing the 2012 Olympics in London as well. Um, you can see some of the projects they've done here. Uh, crime spotting in Oakland and San Francisco is a project where you can go and see real-time crime statistics for those cities. Uh, they're they, they're responsible for um, dig labs where you can see different visualizations of dig stories, um, log on or log me in, um, and wireless visualizations. But they're a fantastic design company. They do great work, and we knew that working with them, we would see we would see the data in ways that we hadn't imagined we could see the data and see things that uh, that we wouldn't see otherwise. Um, one of the things, one of the the ways that they were able to work with a large data set is through the use of solar, which you can talk a little bit about. So uh, solar is a Apache project, and uh, it's built on top of the uh, 
Lucene, Lucene Engine. It was developed by CNET in 2004. Uh, and it was developed by CNET and do donated to the Apache Foundation in 2004. Um, what uh, makes uh, Solar interesting for a project like this is that it allows you to rapidly dive into the data. Uh, it's very fast to ingest data, build indexes over it, and it provides uh, facet search and uh, date faceting. So uh, faceting basically is, uh, at the core of it, is a group by operation that you can run sums and uh, think about our operations against. Um, so we've used that uh, to, um, to explore the data with Stamen. And uh, we'll present some uh, interesting visualizations that um, we pulled out of uh, solar. And um, uh, we used some innovative um, newer graphing concepts um, for those visualizations. So there are two kinds of graphs that Stamen used with the data. The first is a horizon graph, which I'll talk about in a little more detail. And the second is a stream graph, um, which may, you might be a little bit more familiar with. I'll talk about horizon graphs first. Um, horizon graphs were uh, introduced in 2008 in a paper by these folks. Um, Stephen Few is a design blogger and consultant. He, his, his site is the Perceptual Edge, and he wrote a paper talking specifically about Panopticon's use, which is a commercial business intelligence company, of horizon graphs. A lot of the images you see are from Stephen's paper. Um, but it's a really interesting way to see um, data that you would normally look at so temporal data you might normally look at in a line graph um, in a compressed form where you can start comparing things and seeing things differently. So you have a traditional line graph, and this is a very good way to look at data over time, and you can see variations in data, peaks and valleys. Um, it's pretty intuitive what this means, but it, it's hard to compare one line graph to another. You can start overlaying line graphs, you can start putting them beside each other, but it gets very busy very quickly. Um, and you can see that this is... a uh, this is 50 stocks over about a year in 2006, all with different line graphs. And it's impossible to really see what's going on with these line graphs or really compare what's going on with them. So horizon graphs allow you to see the same data but in a much compressed form. And the way you do that is you draw a zero line in the graph, at, um, ideally somewhere in the middle of the graph, depending on your graph. And you color the space between the zero line and the line. Um, you color the space above the line in one color, the space below the line in another. And what you have is uh, anywhere, if you look at the red space, is anywhere above the line, you have empty white space. And so you can leverage that white space by essentially flipping the graph up. So now you've, you've cut the graph in half. You can still see the peaks and valleys through the color. Um, and you can compress it further. So, so this graph is, uh, it has six bands of color. And you can see the darker color on top. If you look at those those parts of darker color, those polygons fit in the polygon below in every case. And what you can do is basically compress them down. So what you've wound up with is a graph that takes up less than a fifth of space, but it still gives you a very good sense of the data. So you can see by the intensity of the color and the color itself whether the data is positive or negative and, and how, where the peaks and valleys are. So obviously where the color is more intense, the, um, the peaks and valleys are higher and lower. So if we look at that same graph of 50 stocks with horizon graphs, you get a much richer picture of the data. You can see individually how individual stocks have performed, which, one have, which ones have done well, which ones haven't, and you can start to see uh, trends temporally. So you can see these stocks are all performing negatively in this time frame, and these are performing positively. And that maybe gives you some indication of where you might want to look deeper into the data. Um, the other good thing about this is uh, this inf all, all these line graphs are, uh, it, it doesn't really matter, um, it's all relative. So you're seeing relative peaks and valleys instead of absolute numbers. So that you can see, you know, you might have one stock at, that, that trades at a very low price and another stock that trades at a very high price, but you'll see the same trends because the data is all relative. Uh, so that's horizon graphs. So if you look, so you know, we're dealing with countries all around the world. These are the line graphs of the countries. You can start to see, well, first of all, you can't see many countries on one page. You can start to see maybe some trends in terms of where the peaks and valleys are, but it's hard to kind of um, see them. So this is, this is actually a single color horizon graph, but you, this is internet traffic to gambling sites from different countries around the world. And immediately you start to see 
and this is just in about a week before the World Cup, immediately you start to see, like if you look at the right edge of each of these, of these columns, you see a lot of activity there, which correlates with you know, the day before and the day of the World Cup. Um, and you still see individually where you have a lot of activity. Like in Germany, there's always a lot of activity versus um, Guinea, where there's not a lot of activity until the World Cup. So, and you have many more countries here on this graph than you did before. So it's a really powerful way to see data, temporal data, uh, when you're looking at lots of elements. Uh, so this was really neat. Um, and it does show some trends. Uh, it really gets interesting when we start looking at the stream graphs, though. So I'll let Tobias talk about the stream graphs. All right. Um, so stream graphs are a type of stack graph, um, a complex layer uh, graph. And um, it was developed by Lee Byron. Uh, and he developed it out of a personal interest to visualize his uh, view, his uh, listening habits on Last.fm. Last.fm last last provides you lots of different data about which music you listen to, how often you do that, etc. So he tried to do that with line graphs and uh, different standard uh, visualization techniques. And none of these really brought a clear picture to the table. Um, so he developed uh, this stream graph concept, uh, which um, excels really when you're trying to uh, present um, lots of data to a uh, mass audience. It's not, it's probably not, I mean, it's not a, a accurate, it's not a, a highly statistical representation of the data, but it, it, it gives you uh, ideas of trends and uh, how, how the uh, different layers behave um, independently. Um, in uh, 2008, the New York Times published a, um, a stream graph uh, that uh, showed block, um, uh, the uh, movie ticket sales performance of 7,500 movies over the past 21 years. And um, that was kind of the first uh, publication of stream graphs that uh, was uh, very popular. And it evoked different kinds of emotions. So probably more technical people didn't feel that good about it because it doesn't really give you a good uh, quantitative image of what's going on. And less technical people really like that representation because it, it is very aesthetic. And uh, it lets you visually explore the data much, much better than um, a, a more accurate rep representation of the, uh, the absolute numbers. Um, so here's an example. We'll, help you we'll get into yeah. <laughs> um, Basically, and, and this is actually what we'll walk through. What the stream graph graphs do is they let you start seeing trends, and then depending on your system, you can start drilling down into the data either with more stream graphs, which is what we'll do, or, or other data. Um, so this graph is worldwide internet traffic to some of our gambling customers from the 5th through the 13th. And of course, the World Cup started on the, uh, of June of this year, started on the 12th. So what you see is a pretty regular pattern of internet traffic. Um, it's heavily dominated by European countries and the UK, mostly because a lot of our gambling customers are in the UK, but also they have a, a pretty good gambling culture there, um, online gambling culture anyway. Um, and you see there's a lot of activity during the day. It drops off at night, comes back during the day. Um, you see activity on Saturday, and then, and then more activity than the other days of the week. Uh, but it's pretty regular until the day before the World Cup, where you see it spike and then um, continue to stay high. So this is interesting. Um, it is dominated by the UK and Europe. So what we're going to do is drill down into different continents and different countries, and then eventually different network characteristics of the data to see other trends. Uh, and, and you can see little examples of little anomalies in here, but once you start drilling down, they become a little bit more apparent. So if we look at just Europe, um, it pretty much looks the same. Uh, you start to see little weird things like up here, you see this little choke point. Um, but it pretty much looks the same. So let's take a look at everything but the UK since it was so heavily weighted from it with the UK. So now it starts to look a little bit different. You start to see less of a, a, the rhythm is still there, but it's less extreme. So you see more activity throughout the day. Um, you also, on the first graph, you could see this little blip, but this becomes a lot more apparent here. Um, Friday morning, there's something going on. And you see that's this red band in the middle 
which is associated with the, with the US. Uh, so there's something going on there. But you also see different countries behaving differently. So the blue up here, um, right above, is the Netherlands. And they have a very regular rhythm of activity during the day and not much at night versus some place like Denmark, which is down here, which has pretty regular activity throughout the day. Um, and then you also have like this green up here is Singapore, where there's not a lot of activity at all in the week before the World Cup, and then it really just blows up. So if we look at Asia, yeah? I'm sorry, but what's the difference between what blows up and what blows down? I, I don't understand what Ah, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, because it's very important to understand it. Uh, this, so the size, it's, it's like a stacked graph. So the size of the color is more traffic, more queries. And what this data represents is uh, IP address queries from these companies. It doesn't necessarily mean that people are gambling. So someone could be coming from the US and hit the site and be denied. So my question really is, uh, what is zero and why is it different from a graph that is flat and all these things like that? So typically when you, when you use stack graphs, um, you, you have a couple issues. So first of all, if you use lots of time series, um, series that don't contribute that much data kind of disappear in a graph visually. So the other issue is if you have two, um, uh, two series of equal vertical um, height, but with different sloping, uh, one of the two tends to disappear visually. So uh, this methodology really is to visually pull those out and not make them disappear and stand, stand apart. So it's not so much like I need to know exactly the slope, but I, I want to know what the movement of the individual layers is. Right. How do you know? It's actually uh, an, an algorithm that uh, that oh. you right. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. So yeah. So it's very, it's uh, detailed. Uh, it, it, there's detailed documentation in the paper um, that uh, was linked on on the previous slide. So yeah. Um, and you'll see you'll see kind of how it differs from a stacked area graph when we look at the UK specifically, and it's a nice example of how a stream graph kind of changes, it, how it's different from a stacked area graph in some ways. Um, does that help at all? I mean, basically, what, what you're seeing here, what you're looking for are trends. Um, and in some cases, it gives you some answers. But in more cases, it just raises additional questions that you may or, not, may or may not be able to answer with a stream graph. Um, so we're looking at Asia. So Asia looks a little bit similar to Europe, except that you don't have that big spike on Saturday because it's because for for the customers that were seeing this traffic, Asia isn't as much of a gambling culture traditionally. But you do see them coming to these um, to these gambling sites during the World Cup, before and during the World Cup. So um, and again, you get a much better view here of the impact of of Singapore and, and their big traffic, which is represented in the middle here, where it just kind of explodes. Um, so this gives you an idea of, of gambling patterns in, in Asia. If we look at the US, where you saw that kind of weird spike, um, well, this is North America. But, but this is, instead of by country, we did it by organization, because it actually gets very interesting. So if you look at the, so the, the immediate thing that you might notice here is the, that regular rhythm is gone. It's a pretty straight graph, for the most part. You have these blips, which uh, I'll talk about in a second. But even even in the bands, there isn't a regular pulse of activity. So when you look at the actual organizations, it's hard for you to read that. But red is Google. Um, so either your counterparts in, in Mountain View are staying up all night gambling every day, or there's something else going on. You start looking at the other organizations, like Microsoft and Yahoo, and you realize what these are bots um, that are indexing the site. So that all of a sudden makes sense, where before you might have seen a lot of traffic from North America through the sites and not been able to explain it, um, because really you go to a site once, you get denied, and that you don't try again. This is much more uh, understandable. These um, these kind of anomalies are, are weird. This this one on this side is was Comcast cable in, in San Rafael, California. And so there was just a, a bunch of activity on Saturday. Uh, I don't know why. 
I don't know. I mean, we can look at further and we can say, okay, which sites were they going to? What uh, IP addresses were they? Does, is it many IP addresses or single IP addresses? Um, but it's something to look into. It could be completely legitimate or it could be illegitimate. It could be, um, it could be someone probing the site before an attack. It could be someone probing the site for legitimate reasons. It could be the site itself doing some, running some test. Um, you see the same thing here. This one's in Phoenix from a publishing company. Again, very odd to see that level of traffic the day before the World Cup, but it could be, again, legitimate or illegitimate, and certainly it's strange. You also see that choke point that I mentioned earlier much more pronounced here. Um, and you see that on all the graphs, and um, that could be an attack. Maybe um, the servers went down because of an attack, or maybe they went down because they crashed, or maybe they maybe some of these sites took their servers down for maintenance. It happens to be during, I mean, it's a bad maintenance window, and then it's in the middle of the World Cup. But if something bad was happening and they had to take the site down, then it makes sense probably to do it when traffic was low anyway. So it, that's probably what it is. Um, but it's interesting looking at these graphs and kind of coming up with theories for this. And then as a customer of the data, you would be looking at this. As an industry, it, it's interesting to think about what's happening in the industry. Yeah. Um, if you, you can, it's not just relative, you can, you can get information about how many total queries this is and then you can start figuring out what the traffic numbers actually are. What I would do if I actually wanted to know what those numbers are, I'd, I'd query the data directly for that time frame and find out what the queries are. Um, I, I don't for this particular graph, but we could come up with them. Yeah. So that's, that's the way that the graph works. It tries to, um, and maybe you can explain this better to you, but it tries to kind of um, equalize the, the data. And you'll see this in some other graphs where there's less data, that the graph shifts more. Where there's more data, it's better at equalizing. Yeah. Right. Right, and I don't know exactly what the graphing software is doing there, but it's basically an a, a, um, artifact of the graph. Next one. Yeah. Um, so this is everything but Europe, Asia, and North America. So again, you see this kind of shift because there's less data overall, so the weighting is, is less. But you start to see interesting things again, like which countries um, outside of those three main markets are are good markets for gambling and gaming, and so. Here you have South America in green, um, in gray, I forget who gray is, oh, Australia. Um, and you see, again, South America has a good rhythm. Australia, they stay up later, or they're gambling at different times, but it's more of a, an equal band until you get to uh, Wednesday. Interestingly, Australia started betting really early. If you look at other countries, I, I was looking at other countries like Malawi, and when I was looking at Malawi, I was just looking between um, Friday and Friday, and it was just basically flat, except for a spike somewhere on Monday or Tuesday. And I thought, well, I, I guess they didn't have a team in the World Cup, so they weren't interested in it until I looked at, because every other country started betting on Friday, and then I looked at Saturday, and then there was a huge spike. So it's just interesting to see the different mentality of different countries, and I, I don't think Nigeria played until the 13th, so it could be that they were betting on African teams, I don't know. But it's, it's interesting to come up with hypotheses about this. So now we'll look at three different countries in Europe, starting with the UK because it represented so much data. This is just a, a very interesting stream graph because it, you basically have a stream graph and if you take away London, you have a stacked area graph on top of it because London basically creates a zero line. Um, but this essentially matches the European data in terms of its pulse and, again, everything I talked about with betting on the weekend and the choke point and things like that. So um, if we take away London, it'd be interesting to see if, if the UK is sort of heterogeneous in the way it gambles and the graph essentially looks the same. You start to see a little bit more detail in terms of what other cities in the UK are gambling online, um, but it basically looks the same. So let's look at something that looks different. So here's Germany. Uh, you kind of have this rhythm, but it it's also a little bit all over the place. You have, you know, Monday morning people come into work and they stop betting. 
but then they sort of get over their guilt and they, they go online and continue betting. <laughs> um, Germany's first game was on the 12th, and so you see a big spike here. Uh, but it's pretty consistent. They're online all the time betting, unlike the UK. And you also have this huge um, area that kind of looks like London did in the UK, except this is Karlsruhe, which is not any place I've heard of. So it's a little bit harder to explain until you start looking a little bit deeper into, into the data. And this is actually one in one Internet AG. They're an Internet provider. They have a big hosting facility in Karlsruhe. And so, you know, we're locating their traffic where their, where their data center is because that's the last point we see. And so in our data, this would be represented with a routing type of regional, regional proxy. So, you know, we know what country it's in, but we can't necessarily tell you what city it's in. But at least we can tell you it's Germany. And so now, now that makes a little bit more sense. Um, but that's Germany. We'll look at Denmark next, which also looks really crazy. Um, there's really no pattern here. Um, you have this huge red and these huge blue. Definitely you see a lot of activity during the World Cups. Um, and so that big red most likely represents consumer traffic. Um, it's strange that this blue is really active here and really active in the, the middle of the week before the World Cup, and then kind of dies out completely. Um, when you look at the organization behind these, um, that blue is basically a, a, a website that reports odds for games, and it refers traffic to, to gambling houses. So for whatever reason, there's a lot of people online checking the odds of different matches, whether it's World Cup or not, and going to betting sites and placing bets. Uh, the red is similar to what you saw in Germany and Karlsruhe. It it's, seems to be a, a hosting provider, although it also has provides VPN services. Um, I don't know why there's a big spike there. Maybe there was some other major sporting event that people were betting on. Um, but certainly, if, you know, if I want to learn more about the Denmark market and how it works, this is something that would, you know, I would start looking into why there might be a big spike, and then a complete drop in activity, and, and what's going on. Um, so I mentioned that we have this geographic data. We also looked at the data in terms of the network characteristics. So the next few graphs, to be as we'll cover, and uh, they show how people are connecting um, and, and routing to get to these right. gambling sites. So what we see here is uh, a stream graph representing the uh, um, connection types. Uh, meaning uh, what we do is we categorize um, network blocks uh, by how they are connected to the Internet. So you have uh, the SNL link cable um, down here in red and uh, yellow, which uh, are, you know, you would expect those to be dominating. Uh, there's a pretty healthy uh, amount of um, uh, wireless bedding going on here. That's uh, represented as purple on this graph. And... Uh, we have this uh, green band that uh, shows this uniform traffic coming through here, six connections. So that, again, is probably most likely the U.S. traffic that we saw earlier uh, that originated from the large uh, search providers. Um, and we see that as fixed connections here. Um, yeah, yes. You wanna... All right. So... As I said, there was a pretty healthy amount of mobile betting going on. And uh, so now we're, we're um, segmenting the data by uh, um, mobile providers. And uh, since most of the traffic came from the UK, we see uh, T-Mobile UK and uh, Hutchison um, 3G uh, being the dominant providers here. So this is kind of interesting if you, you know, to, to slice data like that, it's, it's, it's interesting to understand which providers uh, users are with. You can use that for marketing or target ads. Um, but uh, so just the fact that it's uh, that, that you actually are able to identify that it's coming from a mobile carrier helps you uh, in a sense because you know the user's mobile, so whatever IP geolocation tells you is probably something that uh, you um, uh, should not rely 100% on, but you can use uh, confidence factors and other data points that uh, we give our customers to uh, uh, understand uh, these circumstances. So there was also a segment of dial-up users uh, 
and uh, that was actually kind of surprising because it was a decent percentage of, uh, yeah. of the overall traffic. And again, the UK is dominating the traffic there. Uh, there's some US traffic there. Um, Japan. Yeah, Japan. Tanzania. Uh, and then there's you know lots of developing countries on there, which apparently still use uh, modems. Um, anonymizers. So um, when you're uh, operating a gambling site, uh, you want to make sure that uh, your customers are not circumventing um, your IP geolocation solution. And typically, they'll try to do that by connecting through a proxy server that provides, uh, provides a certain level of anonymity. Um, if you're trying to gamble with a UK provider, what better proxy to use than one in the UK? And uh, that's basically what we see here. Um, Maybe I can say a word about yeah. anonymizing the data. So the way that Quova identifies anonymizers, we identify anonymizers by specific IP address and activity we see. We also, um, because we provide our data as network blocks, we also identify network blocks that have anonymizing activity in them. So a lot of this activity is probably not anonymizer activity, but is in a network block where we've seen anonymizer activity. Certainly, so I wouldn't expect that every transaction that you see here is associated with someone using a proxy. But you can see that you know, the graph certainly gets um, wider as it moves to the right, which is what you'd expect during a big event that you'd see more anonymizer activity uh, at these sites. And as to be said, more in the UK because they're trying to reach sites that are in the UK. Right. So basically what we flag is bad neighborhoods, so like the crime spotting data. If you look at it, this is a network block that uh, had some sus suspicious activity going on in the past or recently. Um, so you should be cautious in dealing with that type of traffic. And uh, so now we, uh, we segmented the uh, anonymizer population by uh, carriers. And uh, it's not very surprising that most of these anonymizers are um, actually with um, hosting providers. So uh, they're probably not systems that are actively being used by actual users, unless the sysadmin is betting for some customers. Box, I guess. Um, and these can be compromised machines or hosts that people have set up specifically for this? Yeah. So someone might get uh, a cloud instance or whatever, set up squid, or um, the other uh, possibility is just that boxes get rooted and uh, people install proxy software on them. And the, the significance of this information is, is that when you're trying to prevent fraud, when you're looking at traffic coming into your site, the more things you can correlate with, the better your predict prediction capabilities are. So if you can correlate, if you know that certain carriers or certain organizations or certain countries um, or certain connection types correlate better with known fraud, then knowing all that data when it, traffic is coming in lets you treat those connections differently than you would otherwise. And that's what the financial institutions do. That's what e-commerce sites do. That's what gambling houses do. Uh, and that's why it's important to have this information. So, um, you know, it was a pretty brief look at a very small part of our data. We're just starting looking at this data. We're just starting looking at different ways to visualize the data. What we'd like to do is make a lot of this information public because the more people looking at it, the, the more interesting things we'll find in the data. Um, as people start looking at the data, I expect that you know, we'll see more trends in the data and that we can start to use a lot of this usage data to do things like predict events, predict and prevent fraud, um, look at marketing trends. Um, and there are certainly going to be a lot of assumptions that people have about traffic to different markets from different places that um, can be either confirmed or disproved with this data. So we're excited about this. Um, we're going to continue looking at it. Like I said, hopefully we'll make this data public pretty soon. Um, and that's it. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> we were so interesting that we distracted Luke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this uh, will be possible, but uh, I'm, I'm small, so I can imagine that with copyright, uh, uh, that's a different category. 
Yeah. No matter how you get your data, irrespective of how you get it, you're never going to be 100 percent accurate. Right. So apparently that, that's good enough for really trusting this. At least the law says, well, as long as 89 percent of the people are controlling this by hand. Well, I mean, the, what the the laws typically state that you're using, you know, industry best practices. And and yeah, and it's not and there are certain certainly ways to get location data that are not industry best practices. So if you're trying to if if you're you know selling restricted goods to different countries around the world where those goods aren't supposed to be sold, right. then using things like user reported data wouldn't be sufficient. You'd have to use some other kind of data. Or, you know, even GPS now you see spoofing there. So um yeah. Yes. In our experience. Well, in the future, taking more time. Could I say, oh, I just want to get on the phone with the Oh, it's still there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so let me ask, I, I, I'll repeat the question because I don't know if the questions are coming through in the recording, but the question is, when we put this data on the public, do we know what kind of visualizations and graphs will allow, whether it will be static or, or dynamic and things like that? I don't know if you want to take that. Sure. So certainly our goal, goal is to enable um, lots of people to explore the data. So static graphs are not going to be very suitable for that. Obviously, we'll have to provide some level of pre-aggregation to protect the innocent customers. Um, but, uh, it, you know, at, at a, we, we can provide dimensionally aggregated um, data and let people slice and dice those data sets uh, however they want. So that, that's, that's the plan. And, and I would expect that we're going to probably provide some interesting visualizations like this and maybe some more traditional ones that let people get a little bit more statistical and specific with the data. So what I was driving at is obviously you can put up this data and say here's the data, right. it's been anonymized, or what have you, go and put it into R or whatever tool you like. Um, but you've obviously shown us these kind of neat new graph types. Um, right. Are you going to provide some kind of interface where people will actually be able to navigate those specific graph types? That's our plan. I would, I would expect we're not going to, well, at least in the first instance, the the first exploration will be through different graph types rather than just access the data directly. Although we might, depending on how we can aggregate and anonymize the data, make the data directly available. Um, and my second question was with the screen graphs, have you done any kind of cross-dimensional um, analysis for that where you're, you're actually using it to try and spot correlations between trends in two different dimensions or two different metrics? It's interesting. Like We've done that with multiple stream graphs. Like I was talking about looking at a specific city that shows weird activity and then looking at different dimensions of that, but it, that's by running different, well, yeah, running different stream graphs. Um, and it's actually been very interesting for us to see certain things about our data um, that, that weren't completely evident to us before. Uh, but I don't know what the stream graphs capability are to, to look at multiple dimensions in the same graph, if that's what you're asking. some way to, to easily pick out correlations. Yeah. I mean, what, what we wound up doing a lot, I mean, to be as and I spent, we basically spent a long time just creating interesting graphs, and you wind up creating graphs on specific metrics and excluding specific things to, to get to the answer you're looking for. Um, you know, so you look at interesting things like routing types against cities, against carriers and organizations until something starts to make sense. Like that choke point that we saw um, early Saturday morning, I think it was. Um, if it exists across every routing type and across every customer that we're looking at and in every country, then um, it indicates something maybe industry-wide. If it only exists for one of the customers, um, then it's something specific to that customer. And so that's, that's the kind of exploration you wind up doing. Thanks very much. Sure. So there's actually a... Uh, JavaScript library that you can use to to create this. It's called uh, Protovis. 
I, you know, I know everyone's wondering about the stream graph on my shirt, so I'll answer that question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't plan on wearing this shirt. Uh, I brought it, and Tobias mentioned, he pointed out that it, there's a, essentially a stream graph on it, so I realized I had to wear this shirt. Um, so it was not entirely intentional. Um, Some cool designer's idea of data, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I'll let you decide. Thank you.